Well, thank you, Ryan. If you'll listen fast, I'll speak fast. Okay? Tonight we're going to, thank you, talk about one of my very favorite things that we have done here at uh, New Hope. We began this process just almost 10 years ago, I believe, Keith. And in staff meeting, Keith came in and said we need to put together a plan. And ultimately, we, the plan that we came up with, we call 3D. In fact, you'll see on the screen here, you'll see that logo that you're very familiar with now. Discover, develop, deploy is, is ultimately what we came up with at, at that time. Well, the question is, why 3D? I think it remains a really good question. Why D, 3D? 3D is our evaluation tool to see if we are meeting our New Testament objective. And that New Testament objective is this, make disciples. Let me say that again. We have a mandate from the New Testament. It comes from Christ's own lips, his final words, and that is to make disciples. And so in all three of those Ds that you see there, discover, develop, deploy, our main purpose is to go out and make disciples. And that and that's what we'd begin with, the process of helping people to discover Christ. That's our job as a church. Discipleship, by the way, doesn't just happen. It's not something by osmosis that just comes about because you come to church, you become a disciple. That's not true at all. We actually, I'm going to do a little history for you guys. We actually discovered that good while back. We had something back in 1954 called A Million More in 54. And then through the years, we've had add one, everyone at, you know, whatever it was. There's so many different things, just new mottos all the time. And the problem was this. We were getting people into the baptistry, but we were not getting discipleship into the people. And so what we had was we had a whole generation of undiscipled. And now listen to me because I'm old. I can say this. We have a generation of undiscipled folks who have remained babies and children in the faith. Theology and discipleship were on the back burner, and the thing that was in front of them always was evangelism only. Well, man, evangelism is the key thing that we do, but Christ's command was what? Go and make disciples. Uh, it's a process. It's a movement. When we designed 3D, uh, we had this purpose. It wanted us to, we wanted to do this. We wanted to measure success of making disciples. How do we know if that process has been, been fulfilled? And what we, what we discovered, and as we began to check out other churches and what they're doing, it's what you do as a Baptist, by the way. You go out and you look at other churches and see what they're doing and then imitate it. But thank goodness, Keith said, we're not going to do that. And for good reason. When you start looking at the, the plan for most churches, it's linear. Okay, it starts here, and then it develops, and then it stops here. Okay, and you've seen that. Sometimes you pull up, and this is what we do as a church. Well, 3D is not that at all. It is discover Christ so that we can do what? Develop people, discipleship people, and deploy people so that others can discover Christ. Christ. I remember presenting this to a conference in uh, Orlando, Florida, some probably eight years ago now, and uh, we, had, we had not finished it. We had not even presented it to the church, but we'd come up with it, and I remember when we got through, there's a back row of people just started applauding, said, we need that. That's what we need, and so because of that, many people stole that from us, <laughs> which, was, which, is, which is really, really a good thing. Uh, so, we're talking about fluidity, a, a fluid pattern, a pattern that, that involves movement and has dimension to it. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20 says this, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The first thing Jesus said after he said, Authority is given me, he said, Go, therefore, and make disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. He makes that final promise. And lo, I am with you always. Go and make disciples and teach them is the objective of what we've come up with. The heart behind Discover is that we are as believers are every day in the midst of inviting neighbors, friends, relatives, co-workers, or people we just bump into to discover Christ. 
a good invitation is come to church with me on Sunday. Let me tell you about Christ. Uh, the, the word discover, when you, you look at its definition, it means this, to find something or someone unexpectedly. Find something or someone unexpectedly. I didn't make the decision to go discover Christ. When I was a seven-year-old boy back in 1957, I, y'all can add that up, I'm 71, okay? <laughs> I was playing out in the front yard with my brother, and it was, school was starting, uh, we were just out in the front, and this guy drives up into my driveway, he gets out of the car and said, which one of you is Johnny? I said, hey, I am. And he said, Johnny, I'm your Sunday school teacher. Well, I'd never been to anybody's Sunday school. I have no idea how he got my name. He said, I'm your Sunday school teacher, and I'm here to invite you to come to Sunday school, and I'll meet you and, and, and uh, take you there. And he said, let's go talk to your parents. So we went in. I said, hey, Mom, this is Mr. Pipkin. His name was Wayne Pipkin. He's, and I said, he wants me to come to Sunday school. What do you think? She said, sounds great. So the next Sunday, I went to Sunday school, Mr. Pipkin's class. I discovered if you came every Sunday, you got a star by your name. So I never missed not only did I never miss, I remember going across the street to my good friend Stevie, who was my age. I said, Stevie, you've got to go to Sunday school. It's the coolest thing in the world. Go to Sunday school with me. He went in and said, hey, Mom, can I go to Sunday school with Johnny? And Mom said, sure. So he rode with me to Sunday school. I don't know how many times Stevie came with me to Sunday school. I remember the first three times because the first time he came to Sunday school when the offering was played, and back then we passed the offering plate in Sunday school, and... Uh, they passed it by Stevie, and Stevie put 15 cents in. I mean, a dime and a nickel. I remember that really well. The next week, they passed the plate by. Stevie put a dime in there. The third week, they passed it by. He took a quarter out. And, <laughs> and I, th I thought that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and so he said, but don't tell my mom. Uh, but so Stevie was my good friend, lived across the street from me, and he came to Christ uh, ultimately. But then as a 16-year-old, Stevie was hit in a car accident and did not survive. Am I glad I invited Stevie? Am I glad Mr. Pitkin invited me? Absolutely. I, in fact, there was a time in my ministry when I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, there are people that have invested in me, that have invited me to things that's changed my life. Give me an opportunity to say thank you to them. And so 35 years later in Houston, Texas, at Debbie's, my wife's uh, uh, dad's retirement party, I see Mr. Wayne Pipkin on a, and I get to go up to Mr. Pipkin and say, you don't have a clue who I am, but I'm Johnny Searle, and I came to Christ because you came to my house. You invited me to Sunday school. And what came out of that was this. I was baptized. My mom, my dad were baptized. My mother taught uh, youth Sunday school for over 40 years. My dad was a deacon. And, uh, you know, things come out of that by a simple invitation. It's not a banging on your door, and it's not uh, just coming with the purpose of getting somebody to say a prayer. Because, guys, prayers do not save you. It's the attitude of the heart under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that caused you to repent and under Christ to come and say, I choose this Jesus. Uh, so the story of, of Mr. Pipkin. Uh, you know, the importance of inviting people is we had a, our air conditioner went out and we had a salesman come to our house a couple of uh, weeks back and I remember we were sitting in the living room and conversation was started about what we were going to buy and Debbie asked the question, hey, where do you go to church? It's that simple. Even for introverts, it's that simple. Where do you go to church? Uh, I can tell you a bunch of more stories, but we don't have any time. Uh, you have your own stories. There are some of you I know in this room. I'm looking at your faces now. You first came because somebody invited you to come to church. Uh, invest and invite. You see that on the screen there. Our habit should become this. It should become our habit that we seize every opportunity to invest in people and to invite people. If we have the greatest message of all time, we should be ready to share that good news message with people that we run into, neighbors, friends, people that we love, people that we don't even know. And discovering Christ does not usually happen passively. 
It's an active activity. That's the reason Jesus said, go. That's the reason the scripture tells us go, to go and make disciples. More people will come to our church by personal invitation than any other message. Let me say that again. More people will come to our church by personal invitation than by everything else put together. Let me give you an example. I, I used to write and direct the Austin Christmas pageant, okay? And so we want to evaluate everything we did. And one, we were talking about, has this been profitable? Has it been good for our church? Have we met our objective in doing this? Not to put on a program, but are people coming to Christ and to our church because that we've done this? So I remember the pastor said, Johnny, let's figure this out. So on a Sunday morning, I got up and said, how many of you folks are here today because you first came to the Austin Christmas pageant? Raise your hand. It was over half the room. If we did that today, it would be very, very similar. Barna says that 70% of the people who will come and attend your church would come because they have been personally invited to church. We're all to do the works of the evangelist. Uh, Romans 10, 14 and 15 says this. I love this. So it takes Some of it comes out of Old Testament. How then shall we call on him in whom we have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. We are all preachers of the gospel. We are all, all of us, without excuse to do the work of the evangelist. Wherever we are in the workplace, in our home, with our children, with our, with our neighborhoods as we're talking to them uh, outside. Uh, during the big freeze we had, uh, across the street, a guy, and a gentleman and his wife had moved in. And uh, I went out one day, and you know, the snow was so deep, and got out, and, and I waved him down. I said, how you guys doing? I said, do you all have water? He said, no, we don't have water. I said, well, this side of the street over here, we have water. Come over, and I'll give you, uh, you know, we can load up a big cooler full of water for you. And uh, so he said, great. So I got to know him. His name is Dave. They would moved here from Tennessee. Got to talk to him every day because it lasted for days. He would come over a couple of times a day and we would fill it up with water because in our subdivision, you couldn't get out of our subdivision. And I had two four-wheel drive vehicles and you could not get out. So I got to be a friend of Dave and I got to say, now tell me about where you go to church since you moved here. And he said, well, we haven't started going yet. And mainly because of COVID, I said, you got you to pull up our church online. And so he and his wife started watching online our church every week well that was pretty cool but the other thing was when he'd meet me outside he said well your pastor said this Sunday I want to talk to you about that your pastor said this Sunday he said man what he said really hit my heart but just because I said pull it up online because we he was not to the point yet of coming back to the church those opportunities are there if we will allow the Holy Spirit to direct us I asked the Lord to do this on a daily basis I say, Lord, I have no plans. I don't know what you have for me. But Holy Spirit, make me aware when you put me in front of somebody who needs a word of encouragement and who needs a direction to know Jesus Christ. Pray those for you. You know what will happen? God will put somebody in your path on a daily basis. It will ha- I don't care how introverted you are. Somebody will step in your path and you'll have the opportunity to say something to, to them. This, and I've taught... I've, I've taught multiple weeks of lessons just on this one thing, but I would like to address this. The whole armor of God that we find in Ephesians chapter 6, it says to do this. It says to put on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, put on the, the good news shoes which speed you to present the gospel of peace, take up the shield of faith, receive the helmet of salvation and take up the sword of the spirit most people look at that as only some kind of protection from the evil one no guys it's a lot more than that it is put on the good news shoes which speed you to present the gospel of peace that's part of putting on the armor every day and i visualize myself doing that i said lord here's today another day lord today i put on the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness i put on those good news shoes i take up the shield of faith which destroys all the fiery darts of the enemy i receive the helmet of salvation i take up the sword of the spirit which is your word use me today 
And that's God's plan for all of us as believers to use us with good news shoes to present the gospel of truth. Go, go, go is what scripture tells us to do. The next thing about discover, as we have it written up, is Sunday worship. That's the easiest thing you're going to do, is invite, invite your neighbor to come to church and do it like this. Say, Sunday morning, our pastor's got this great uh, group of messages on grace. Come with me. In fact, I want you to come with me and sit with me in church. Invite them to come, but don't just let them show up somewhere. Invite them to come, and you meet them and bring them in and sit with them in church. Uh, Sunday worship and multiple, multiple surveys. People will decide to come back. We've looked at these Barna surveys and the other church surveys. People will decide to come back to your church within the first seven minutes they arrive in the parking lot. You hear what I'm saying? The first seven minutes they arrive on the parking lot. So what do we do about that? We have golf cart drivers that are driving around with smiles on their face. They say, come on, get, get, in, get in my golf cart. I'll take you up there. And as soon as they get up there, what do we do? We have greeters at the door. Say, hey, we're glad here. Happy Sunday to you guys. Come on in if you'll go up here. We have greeters at all the doors who pass out bulletins, who pass out the Lord's Supper, who are saying that they're glad that you're here. And we've developed this personality as a church. When people are coming in and they're sitting down and they look to you like, I don't know who they are. They may be new. You're getting up and you're going over and you're saying, hey, I'm glad you're here. My name is Johnny. Tell me where you're from. Is this your first time to be here? You know what? If nobody says anything to you, you're probably not going to come back. But if people greet you, have an interest in who you are and what you're doing and who your family is, you'll probably come back. People want to be a part of a loving family. Uh, so Sunday worship, first impressions is big, big part of that. Uh, biblical teaching strategy. Biblical teaching strategy is it needs to be God honoring. That means, th that means this to me. That means that we preach the gospel truth without compromise. It doesn't matter what's going on socially. It doesn't matter what's going on anywhere else. It's preaching exegetically God's worth, the truth of God's worth, which will stand on its own without compromise. And if you do that, it's powerful, and it is life-changing. It is also another thing that we look at in Sunday morning is that not only God-honoring, but it, that it's culturally relevant. Well, that may kind of sound a little strange to you, but take it in and evaluate that. It means we need to evaluate our particular culture. Let me put it to you maybe like in kind of layman's terms for, for my sake. We live where? Central Texas. We have a particular culture. We're just talking to a lady uh, while we were eating a little earlier, and it wasn't that long ago that Leander only had about 1,300 people. Now it's 60 plus thousand. Cedar Park's 100,000. It's a boom. And, every, and you know what? The world has come to Leander. You come to my neighborhood, we have people that have come here from Africa. We have people that have come here from Pakistan, from the Mideast. We have people that have come here. You name it, they're in a neighborhood. And you know what? They're in your neighborhood, too. The world has come to Cedar Park, Leander. Uh, so we share that good news message with a, in a way that is, we would consider to be culturally relevant. So we need to evaluate what that looks like in our worship service. And so we have great music. We have great preaching. There is not a Southern Baptist strategy anymore of two hymns and announcements and a message and invitation, everybody go home. It is, it is more than that. And that is something that is spent, there's a lot of time spent in that. Cultural relevance. I visited my son in a church in uh, Montreal, Canada. It was something like I'd never seen. And this is the, this is the culture of their church. They had about 25 minutes of music, and it was wonderful. And after 25 minutes of music, all of a sudden, uh, the worship leader stood up and said, we'll be back in 10 minutes. If you will, go back in the back. We have a table back there if you're a guest first time. We have croissants and coffee, and we'll have a little countdown, and y'all come back in 10 minutes. And I thought, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so everybody got up. Everybody went back, and 
uh, I went over and got uh, a cup of coffee, and what I discovered was this. The table where they were passing out information about the church and people were lined up there to talk to these people was full. It was full of people. And after a little while, uh, you know, it said, they dimmed the lights and said, service starts in two minutes. All of a sudden, in down, there's the countdown. Everybody was back in their seat. The preacher got up and preached. Well, that was powerful to me. They went way outside the box as far as I was a Texas Baptist guy could understand. But you know what? It worked. It absolutely worked. And that French-Canadian culture, the stop for 10 minutes for croissants and coffee and to make conversation, and I went back and listened to the conversation. And it was, tell me about your family. How long have you been in Quebec? How long, you know, where do you live here in Montreal? It's a walking distance to the church. You know, tell me about your children. That's the kind of conversation that was going on back there. And that's how people became invested into the life of the church. It has to have a cohesive flow. We have to be engaging. Engaging means participatory. Okay, you're not just sitting and observing. You're part of the worship. A event strategy. A event outreach. We've talked about this many times. It's intentional targeting of people. We have special events such as Vacation Bible School. We have Sports Camp. We have Fall Fun Fest. We have Christmas Eve and Good Friday and Easter. And by the way, today, Christmas Eve... Good Friday and Easter are two of the biggest things that we're finding out that we're doing. To my surprise, several years ago now, when I was on staff here, one of the big things that made the biggest impact on reaching people was sports camp. Because we evaluate, we evaluate everything. How many people came to sports camp? How many of those people came back? And it was, it was kind of astonishing to me. I don't know what COVID's done to that, but... That was, that was something that really worked. So we equip people to invite others if we're out at VBS or sports camps or whatever that may be. Matthew 22, verse 37 says this. Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We invest in others, and we invite them because we care about our neighbors as much as we care about ourselves. And so that's our challenge. That's our goal, to go out into our community, to go from our homes to where we are letting it known that this is a place that you would love to be a part of. And you make lifelong friends here. But if you don't, that, don't even do that in a short term, you can discover Christ. So I'm going to end there.